po krótkiej przerwie. Powracamy do DOFY. Witamy się ponownie z tutaj z licznie zgromadzoną publicznością w Muzeum Architektury oraz z tymi, którzy są z nami po drugiej stronie ekranu. No i pora chyba na kulminacyjny punkt wieczoru, czyli wykład keynote speakerki Tatiany Bilbao pod tytułem The New Landscape, The Social One. Ja jeszcze może raz przypomnę, że wykład będzie w języku angielskim, tłumaczony będzie na język polski za pomocą słuchawek, które są przy wejściu do tej sali, więc jeśli ktoś z takiej pomocy potrzebuje skorzystać, to gorąco zachęcamy. Więc teraz już prosimy o uspokojenie oddechów ekscytacji. Na wszystkie pytania, zarówno w języku polskim, jak i angielskim, będzie czas na odpowiedzenie później, zarówno też od osób po drugiej stronie ekranów, powiedzmy. A teraz chciałybyśmy przedstawić naszą gościnę, czyli Tatianę Bilbao. Jest to architektka, która utworzyła swoje studio, e-studio. W 2004 roku biuro skupia się na tematach, na wartościach społecznych, na kolaboracjach, na takim czułym podejściu do procesu projektowania. Zanim stworzyła swoje biuro, była doradczynią w Ministerstwie Rozwoju i Mieszkalnictwa Rządu Dystryktu Federalnego Miasta Meksyku oraz członkinią Generalnej Dyrekcji Rady do Spraw Rozwoju Miasta Meksyk. W swoim biurze skupiają się na działaniu w różnych okolicznościach, na, skupia na 
rozwiązywaniu kryzysów, a wszystko to opierają również na analizach i badaniach. Nie, nie przedłużając, gromkie brawa na naszej gościni. Hello, um, it is my real great pleasure to be here with you. Um, thank you for inviting me, thank you for having me. Um, I really thought it was important to uh, be able to share with you a little bit of um, the ethos behind the work we do and, um, and to, to, to accompany it with kind of the thought of the office alongside showing the projects. I hope I can compact everything of that in, in just one hour. In recent years, the city has become a popular conversation in architecture culture. Citing Pierre Vittorio Aurelli in his introductory essay, the book, the, the City as Project, we have been going with a familiar mantra. Today, more than half of the population live in big cities, no? Or by 2050, 70% of the population is gonna be in urban areas. Etc. Etc. We have heard these. At least I have heard these um, from architecture school to uh, even uh, family conversations at the end of dinners. But nevertheless, that we have been hearing this for so much, it has not been enough for us architects, or at least not many of us I know, uh, dedicating their time to think on designing the city. And I think that the excuse is that it sounds impossible at the city uh, right now, and we so sometimes said, or also hear, that the city is shaped by abstract forces. I have also heard the word organic in some conversations. These forces that uh, most of the time are pulling in counter directions um, are those who so-called are now shaping the cities, and this is why we think we can't imagine those. But the truth is that those forces that, yes, they are shaping the city, have nothing of abstract or less of organic. They're not innocent. Those are market forces that determine who and how can inhabit the territory. Forces that more and more have been expelling the majority to perpetuate in the city's capital and production. Coinciding again with Aureli, we then should understand that even though we think we're not determining the city, if we're designing any piece of architecture in that city, that is designing the city. Every city is designed by each bench that is there, by each sidewalk, obviously by each building, by each piece of infrastructure that we insert on it. And therefore, we are designing the city. So I really, first of all, uh, want to make a point that we must think that every piece that we're inserting in every context is shaping the lives uh, that someone or all of us will live in the future. The city is both the result of the necessity and desires. Cities exist because it's a place of gathering, of opportunity, of knowledge, of productivity, of cultural exchange, but primarily they exist because us human beings need each other to exist. Yes, we are human beings that need ourselves, our individuality, our identity, our own uh, specific perspective, but we cannot survive with the help of the other. The city that we live in today is the result of the society of production. The one that was built on carbon fossil fuels, uh, or as Elisa Iturbe calls it, the era uh, that was built on energetic abundance, the era of carbon form. He, she really states this in her, um, in her text, Architecture and the Death of Carbon Modernity, where we can really understand, um, as she describes, that the city that we live in today is the same city for the last 200 years. And yes, it might have been looking different in the early um, um, years of the 20th century, of la la late 19th century, the messy industrial city. Um, later on, the much more uh, modern 
uh, uh, organized city. Later on, the city became much more the, the reproduction or the, or the image of that society of consumption passing through the, for the city. Today, we live in that city, but it has, has the same form, which, according to her, is called the carbon city. And why? Because everything is designed around the fact on how we produce today. And how we produce today is exactly the result on which energy uh, we use, which right now is based basically in carbon, in fueling with carbon fossils, um, fuels. So I really think that uh, we, uh, we today have a new mantra, no? When I was growing up, the mantra was, we're going to be more than half of the population in the big cities. Right now, the new mantra is, what is the post-COVID city? But I think the pandemic has not caused the problems that we have today, not even uh, the pandemic itself. The pandemic had, it has exposed the problems that we live today and has taken advantage of them. Uh, so I, this is probably why we're listening, no? What is the new post-COVID city? I think that we should not be thinking on what is the post-COVID city. I think it's urgent and necessary to understand what is the post-carbon city. It is clear that we need to get rid of those uh, carbon fossil fuels to fuel our societies and change radically the way we do it. But by doing so, we will not eliminate the carbon form if we don't transform the form of the city. The city is completely surrendered to production. And the, 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 how you can see it is that today, to exist in every city, we need to produce. This means that to eat, to have a shelter, to have care, to have childcare, to have elderly care, to have whatever we need to survive, we need to have money. And this is going to an extreme, to a point which people that are expelled from those urban environments can struggle, struggle very, very much on even how to eat every day. But if we understand that this is um, really a very big irony in which we are living on, then probably it would be easier for you to change in your mind what is the next uh, form of the city. To produce, we first need to exist. So this is why for me that the post-carbon city is called the city of care. The, the notion of care, which often is ignored in the economy uh, and is erased from our cities, is tucked into our households, is the labor that we rely to exist, as I said. Care is today an unpaid labor in which capital is sustained. Because if we don't exist with the labor that is not paid, we cannot produce. Meaning that everybody that does the care labor is today subsidizing the economy. And that currently is done 95% by women. The current dynamic and the physical realm promotes individuals as actors to pursue their own labor practices to earn support for themselves. This means exactly to really be able to care from, for themselves. The city is completely shaped by it. Everything, every structure is responding to that production mode, even the house. I think that we urgently need, um, sorry, something happened with the presentation. Yeah. We urgently need to think, uh, not only, as I said, what is the form of our city and how our cities could become potentially the platform for the society to produce a change and to really understand and put in the core, in the center, the, the fact that we need to first exist to then produce. I really, I'm not that innocent and I really know that architecture cannot solve all the issues in the world. But for sure, as I described, architecture becomes what shapes our lives. And definitely society is enabling possibilities because of it or 
it's not able to enable other possibilities because of it as well. And I will explain around my lecture on what do I think uh, it's preventing us to do that and what I think it's going to allow us to do that. I have been studying the domestic environment since I started my career. And it's because I understand that for me is the most um, important and really basic unit for our existence. I have always seen, since I went out of school, architecture as a primary form of care. Architecture provides shelter to our bodies to exist. We cannot survive in the wilderness. And yet, it provides something else. We also have proven that caves are not enough for society to progress. We need spaces that inspire us. And I don't use inspiration as a romantic, romantic word of, you know, we need to be um, um, enhanced by beauty. I do think that inspiration means the platform we need to nurture our souls and bodies to grow and to learn. So I do think that we uh, humans uh, are a complex uh, organism, natural organisms, that do need a shelter, yes, but that also need platforms uh, to grow uh, that inspire our lives. I um, was uh, invited in 2008, no, 2008 of March of 2020, meaning that was three days before the lockdown in Mexico City, um, but we still didn't know. Um, to give a lecture in a, in a conference um, like this one, in an in a old space like this one, incredibly nice to remember that, um, that was held around the International Women's Day. And a, a woman architect, Gabriela Carrillo from Mexico City, had invited me to um, participate in this, in this seminar. And he asked me to do a lecture on my work. And I said, only a lecture on my work? You don't need me to speak something specific? No. So I thought um, that I wanted to put together a lecture speaking on how my work had opened paths and uh, for erasing discriminations, for including more people, for being able to become uh, shelters that would enhance humans' lives by uh, understanding the needs of everybody. And I started putting together this lecture. Uh, I was very happy that I had a very long flight to arrive to this conference. And so I had a lot of time to reflect on it. And I realized very quickly on uh, starting my presentation that my work had not only not done anything to erase discrimination, for example, against women, against other bodies, against other cultures, against other ways of living. It had been everything to perpetuate those discriminations. And I realized uh, profoundly, because to start with, I had never been so critical, so deeply critical on uh, what uh, a house as a unit is and is doing to our society. The house that we now repeatedly um, design all over and, you know, kind of um, canonize as the model in we all shall live on is really uh, relying on three incredible fictions, as Fernanda Canales very clearly says it in her introductory essay for her book, Mi Casa, Tu Ciudad, My House, Your City privacy in a shared world. Um, this book, unfortunately, is not in, Span in English, it's in Spanish. But she, she describes these three frictions. No? The house is designed as a place of rest, as if work could be separated from life, first of all, which it doesn't happen everywhere. And second of all, and most importantly, as if housework would just disappear or not be labor. The house as private property within everybody's reach as if when considering that exactly, private property, it will not become a commodity, then it would de determine by market-driven forces and it makes it unaffordable for the majority. And the house as a sanctuary of the nuclear family, husband, wife, and children, as if there were no other forms of coexistence and the private and public realm were two independent fractions. Therefore, I declare in that lecture myself guilty 
because I had never really truly understood how to incorporate into my ideas of domestic space and the designs that we had done, how to really um, erase the notion that the house is where our house, uh, our house labor, reproductive labor is tucked in, and that becomes the most discriminative job in the earth because it's not recognized as paid labor. Today, as I said before, it's done 95% by women uh, because women are the most vulnerable um, gender of society of the major genders because obviously also we are just thinking, and I'm just speaking as if there were only two genders, but it's, that's not the truth. Women are doing this labor because they have been relegated from economy. So those who are relegated from economy, also other more racialized people or other genders are doing this job because they are not getting paid for it. And someone has to do it for us to exist. Of course, uh, the ideal would be that uh, we would have um, that labor as recognized in the economy and that would be recognized as the most important labor. That is, not some, that is anything that architecture can do. But architecture can do a lot for not talking in the domestic realm and for being able to create platforms for that at least to be shared if it's not paid. So that's the first stance on how we can really think on the house as a different form. Secondly, if we make those houses really as private realms, we are perpetuating the impossibility of the majority to have a place, really a place where uh, they can live because this would become always marketable and we are taking, and we are then standing on uh, the notion that house is a value and not a space for protecting human life or, a lot, or even more so enabling human life. And the third fiction that Fernanda Canales says is the uh, heteropatriarchal family in which this house, uh, this model of house is designed all over the world. Only 18% of the population in the world today live in this configuration. This means the majority, the vast majority of the population has not this configuration. Nevertheless, the whole market built environment is designed for this, for this family. But not only that, I said in this moment, 18% of the population, it's because if you have this arrangement, if you are now in one of those 18%, this will last very few years of your life. We say 20, maybe, maximum, because before you had no kids, after kids are gone. That's very simple equation. So the house doesn't longer serve for your purpose. But I would also add something else. The house, uh, on this, based on these three fictions, is also not taking in account that the majority of the people in the planet, I would even dare to say that none of us in the planet live the same way, nor have to live the same way. In Mexico, housing is a constitutional right. Uh, the Constitution says that uh, uh, everybody, it, it is until a month ago, but it's not yet changed physically in the Constitution, but it's approved. Until a month ago, it said every family has the right to have an enjoyable and dignified place to live. They have changed it to every person that is advancing. But the second thing is that the second article of the Constitution in Mexico relies that, 90, uh, that, the, that the country is uh, formed pluriculturally. This is that uh, the Constitution recognizes that there are 67 different cultures embedded in Mexico and that all of them have their own um, ways of uh, their own ways and costumes and cultures independently. Nevertheless, the law derived from thy whole house, uh, from thy housing right, uh, describes the house as being that uh, as minimum with one kitchen, one bathroom, two living ro two rooms, and one living room. That house fits nobody of those 67 communities that the, the Constitution says it recognizes. Uh, 
The Mayans, I'm going to give one example of those 67 because this is a very vast culture which is uh, talked in the south of the country. It's a population that has existed in this region for 10,000 years. They don't inhabit the planet as we do. They don't use a kitchen inside the same volume. They have compounds arranged differently according to their social arrangement, which is not the heteropatriarchal family. It doesn't mean it's not hierarchical, and it doesn't mean it's not patriarchal. I'm not romanticizing the way they live. But they live completely different, and they have volumes that are holding different um, activities during different hours of the day and during different days of the year. They don't sleep in the same place every day. Why? Because every day the weather is constantly changing, it's very, very hot, it's very, very humid, and they choose the better place to sleep. So their house doesn't fit what the law describes as a house. Therefore, they're not subject to property, they're not subject to credit, they're not subject to uh, subsidy, and they're, of course, because they're not subject of that. And plus, on the other hand, all the cultural notions that are bombarding them are changing the way they live. I'm going to explain why, with a simple gesture, this is not only harming um, the evolution of humankind, it's harming completely the environment. Right now, if you ask anyone from Sri Lanka to North Carolina in the United States to South, K South Africa or Argentina, how would you draw your, uh, your house? They will do probably all a similar drawing. I really urge you, all of you, to really understand that by replicating those notions, we are colonizing the way everybody lives in this planet. And yes, it's not only us, it's media, it's um, uh, films, it's uh, written aspiration, it's social media, but obviously it's also architecture. Because of us repeating that, or maybe the other way around, we don't know, it's even embedded in laws and norms all over the world, as in my country it is. So I urge you to look at the house uh, in a completely different way. We really all, all of us, need to sleep for sure. We need a place, an individual place for our own individual life to be uh, nurtured, to be reconstituted. We need, some of us, that means sleep. For some of us, means knowledge. For some of us, means just moment for ourselves. We do need a private space. But that doesn't mean that that private space needs to equal exactly the space we, le we sleep. But also, we don't all need the same piece of furniture to sleep. We, all, all of us use that piece of furniture, the bed, in different ways. But as I said, in different cultures, that piece of furniture is not the same. In the Mayans, they sleep with hammocks. And for the majority of the population, having a specific room for only sleeping is a luxury also. So we also should think, you know, do we all need that piece of furniture? As I said, the Mayans sleep in, um, live in a very um, humid area with a temperature average of 32 degrees centigrade the year round, meaning that uh, sleeping on nights that is sometimes 38, 30, 39 degrees, with a humidity of 80% in a bed is almost impossible. So they adopted the hammock to be their swing, fan, and easy thing to move from place to place to sleep differently every night, depending on the weather. Also, it is a perfect response for those uh, horrible bugs that are living in this region um, because obviously of the humidity and the temperature, there's snakes, there are tarantulas, there are scorpions, etc., etc. If they sleep in hammocks, they don't, they don't have problems, they don't, they don't have threats on it. Now, today, they have had to change 
completely the way they live, and they have to have these houses that are divided in these, into these little rooms. In these little rooms, you cannot hang a hammock, so they need to buy beds. Beds are impossible to sleep in if you don't have air conditioning or at least mechanical ventilation. That requires you to work more, to have more money, or the state to produce more energy to uh, uh, really bring all that to that place because no longer they can sleep comfortably or healthy. Let's just forget about comfort, let's talk about health. But also, in those beds, the bugs go in. So they have scorpions, climbing up, snakes, tarantulas, etc. Uh, so what do you need? A more robust health system to respond because now you have more problems with health. Yeah, and that is how capitalism works. The bathroom, um, yeah, the room, we have questioned it, right? But I would say also the bathroom. Yes, why we all agree that the technology that has brought us today to the point where we all have run, well, not all, not all, 80% of the population in the world has running water, uh, opening a faucet in their, in their house, it's a great technology, I agree and we should all have the right to have access to water, but we don't all cannot do it the same way, first of all. And second of all, and most importantly, I don't understand why that meant we could tuck in the act of caring for our body physically into a room that sometimes can be built in many codes in many countries of the world without natural illumination and natural ventilation. When did we forget that the place of uh, bathing our bodies is a ritual that uh, nurtures our bodies in many different ways? Not only physically by cleaning it, yes, that's one, but also by nurturing it physically, uh, by touching it, by touching the other bodies, and by really understanding that this is also an intimate space to share things and to uh, start to understanding the need of the other. But also, again, we don't all have the luxury to have a single space for that to happen without anything else happening at the same time, because we don't have a lot of space in the world left anymore. But again, I would like to make her more a point, no? On when did we forget that this is an incredible place for encounter, for uh, bounding relationships, and for creating different possibilities of communal labor that understands the care on our own bodies? And yeah, the kitchen. Here we arrive to the most controversial space of the house. And yes, I will speak later on the on the issue that here is where the most labor is talked is the most labor is happening and therefore the most discriminative area of the house. But although that's the most controversial part, I would say it's not the only one. We decided to mechanize the way we produce food. Yes. Uh, to make it more efficient and then to therefore make it easier for the labor that we talked in one person uh, of the society. But I would say that by doing that, we are eliminating the possibility of nurturing our bodies with, just, with much more than just vitamins and proteins. Yes, we all need vitamins and proteins to live and that's a good thing to put into your body. But that's not the only way we are uh, really um, nurtured. We're nurtured by culture, by flavor, by love on which those um, uh, uh, foods are, uh, are brought in. Yes, the, the kitchen is the most alienating space, uh, first of all, because it's banning communities to be able to understand the notion of sharing care labor, but it's also the place where it's isolating much more the, the labor that we do all have to do and is not recognized. Not matter, regarding if the, house, the kitchen is open or not, that is not really promoting the possibility of opening its path for social exchange, that, that we need to do uh, to hold our existence, um, to hold our existence. I learned this very clearly when we were helping families to rebuild their houses after the earthquake in 2017. Uh, an earthquake that it was very strong, uh, but that it, um, it made 500,000, half a million homes went down. Of course, those houses didn't um, fall because uh, 
only because of the big earthquake. Yes, it was a big earthquake, but those houses should not have been falling. They fell because um, they were built with materials that are coming in with this idea of progress, new materials, industrialized materials, cheap materials like concrete, concrete block, steel, and cement, something that they, in these towns, they never knew. But not only that, obviously those materials and the idea of progress comes also with the idea of this dream house, of the American dream way of living. And we went into these little towns and we understood that yes, although they have to build a house like that, they don't conceive cooking inside the house. First of all, because the food comes with lots of flavors. And if you do a mole, which is a typical food in Mexico, in some regions of Mexico, um, you will sleep with a chile inside your brains for the next month. So of course, they don't, they don't cook inside. But not only that, they don't understand why would you cook um, individually if this is a collective act for a group of people that need to eat um, in sharing culture, knowledge, through flavor and through colors of the food is also something very important in every community. I learned also that stoves are not the most practical thing, not especially in places where you cannot bring gas very quickly, but most of all, because those stoves kill the possibility of making this rich food that depends on these types of, sp of stoves. So we don't all cook in the same, with the same electrodomestics. Nevertheless, we're doing spaces that only the same electrodomestics can fit in. And these people really don't conceive themselves uh, uh, eating themselves alone. Uh, they have that space, but they never use it. Co eating is a collective act. It's a communal act, and it's something that is done together because this is a moment of sharing, of um, sharing not only the food, but sharing the stories, and, and really talking a little bit with those constituents of yourself. This is why the houses that we have been doing really cannot fit nobody, because they're determined and specified for a very defined form of living which doesn't fit I, th I think and I argue, nobody in this planet. And yes, we can go on in, in uh, understanding each of the spaces of the house. The living room, which is only like the reproduction of the bourgeois notion of representation in our little homes, which ha we have proved during the pandemic that obviously it doesn't work. And well, if we can go on and on on that idea of the dream house, no? Because that also is not finished if the house doesn't have a garden. But well, if it has a pool, um, it's even better. That then is the dream house. The problem is that that is really doing nothing for society, and that is really just reproducing something that is creating more and more the impossibility in the planet of the majority of the people to live in. So yes, as I said in that lecture in 2020, I declare myself guilty. And it was the moment that I really understood everything that I had been experimenting on and, um, and seeing through the projects that I had seen, uh, that it all came to my mind together to start really, really potentializing the idea that I had always kind of um, searched for of using architecture as a platform to allow anyone in this planet to create their own way of living not the way of living that we think is good, the way of living that they can each represent. Strangely, those ideas came together um, while doing a, a project that has become a lifetime project, and it's a monastery. Yes, a Catholic um, Cistercian Order monastery. And I was as surprised as you, probably now, receiving the call of Pater Kilian, who is a Cistercian monk from an abbey in Austria in Heiligenkreuz, uh, asking me for help to design their new monastery. And yes, I was the same skeptical thinking on the in Catholic institution as an institution, again, generalizing aspects uh, that not everybody fits in and categorizing um, an insti a, a, a monastery with an institution that really have very little to, to talk together. So 
I open myself and I discover an incredible world. And as I said, it has not only become a lifetime project, it has become a life-changing project. Not only I, I discovered that the monastery is the ultimate domestic space, I really understood that for me, or at least uh, of everything I've seen, is the only typology I have ever, ever encountered that is designed specifically to hold a physical body to exist. So not only holding a body, physical body to exist, understanding that the body is not about habits, it's about rituals that nurture it, allowing it to exist in this physical realm, in this case in the monastery to live this spiritual life. A monastery, a Cistercian monastery, is very specifically designed in accordance to the rhythm of the body, and that, for me, and we don't know what what came first, uh, one or the other, the uh, rituals that the monk should perform to hold their spiritual life. This is a very specific typo. Uh, typology that is repeated exactly the same, only adapted to the conditions of the site, anywhere that it has been done and at any time and any uh, uh, moment of, of life. F of course, it's very specifically designed to follow that ritual or maybe to give shape 
to that ritual, also one can say that. And I'm not, con I'm not here to tell you that you should become monk or that you uh, should even join them f by any means, because first of all, um, that is not what I think it's important. Second of all, they would never uh, try to convince you to do either. But the fact and the things that I have learned are really truly fundamental in my understanding towards uh, architecture. First of all, as I said, one of the most important understandings is that they really, um, they really needed to find a place because that's what they put them together to hold a body to exist. And they understand perfectly because they understood it when they become hermits in the beginning of, of monasticism. Um, uh, monks would live by themselves in the desert when they understood that it was not sustainable to live by, like that alone in the desert. They understood that they needed to become a community in order to live that individual spiritual life. And this is when they founded the monastery. So yes, specifically the monastery, the physical monastery exists there because they understand that they need each other to exist in order to be able to perform this very individual life. So they needed to balance those things in perfect combination. It's also completely balanced um, ag against the hours of the day and against the days of the year. And yes, as I said, the monastery is a very specific typology that has a lot uh, inform us on, on our design on how we're going to go uh, in, in the future. I'm not going to stop there because that's not the important part. The important part is the two big lessons that I think uh, I have taken from that. First of all, as I said, they understand how to balance the notion of the individual human being needing to be in, in itself, with itself. And second, how they understand that relationship to become a possible social relationship that allows that individual body to exist. And they, the understanding of that is that well, the body needs a first physical layer to be, to be able to get protection, which is the robe. Um, their bare body is in the, bare, in the cell, being protected by the robe, and then that cell is connected towards the cloister, which is the first place of encounter with their, their community, their brothers, their own uh, intimate circle. Then from the cloister, that uh, area of the monastery is connected to the more communal spaces with the people that live and share the whole monastery at large, which is the, the um, reflectory, the sacristy, the chapter room, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then that is connected to the church. And the church is the one that makes that relationship with the community at large uh, and the collective at large uh, in this case. The way the monks trans progress through the day is from that very intimate space in those stages towards the church and the other way around. They're never exposed uh, from their individual space, very intimate, next uh, second to the collective out, in, out of the blue. They understand that to create relationships, you need to create bonds that are going from the individual to the, to the collective in stages in parts little by little, not opening a door like we do in every, in every city. You open the door and you are uh, thrown out to the vast collective, abstract one, that is impossible to get related to. Second condition that I understood perfectly is that they don't think their body needs any, uh, to follow any habits. They, they think that uh, the body needs rituals in order to really create this possibility of, it, of its physical existence on Earth. Meaning exactly what I explained the whole time, no? Food is not just about putting vitamins and proteins in your body. It, food is a ritualistic aspect to nurture your body as well. And as I said, I think at the high, we have been exploring a, a lot of these issues in different projects in different ways, but not being so conscious on them. We were working um, since um, almost at the same time we started working with the monastery um, in a project in St. Louis, Missouri, in the United States, uh, to re consolidate uh, uh, um, uh, one of the blocks of these um, neighborhoods that are conformed by rows of single houses uh, that are everywhere in this country, in the USA. 
We were asked to think on how these 20 row houses could uh, really potentially become a new typology for this city. So we really thought on our idea of understanding, no? What, uh, how can we reinforce that individual private uh, space um, and allow uh, certain possibilities of relationship to stage collective uh, uh, relationships in a way that is not just the house and the street, but the house and a space that is shared with two or three families and another space that is shared with five or seven families and another space that is shared maybe amongst the 20 and then to the street and the other way around too. So what we did is we placed the houses uh, not in rows but really tucked in to shared um, different uh, spaces that are formed by the same uh, 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 footprint of the house that are allowing for those single spaces that are uh, uh, enabling different types of relationships. So some that are more um, open and abstract, some that are more collective even for the whole neighborhood, some that become even more uh, community bonding even by friction or by competition, some of them that allow those individuals to do more um, solitary acts in the exterior and uh, some of them that are productive, like an edible garden, some of them that are more ludic for children or for anyone or for children who, are, who stay children forever. And this is how we decided to then invite different architects to design different houses in order to also create a possibility of those individual uh, intimate uh, more private spaces to become also more diverse and allow different types of population. Our house is very simple and we just rotated two volumes in order to even more, make more of that notion of the space that is on top and, and rotated much more private than the space on the bottom that is uh, turned uh, towards the collective space and it starts to speak onto that relationships that wants to create and um, and yen the the other houses are doing all of them different things this is by productora or this is by moss but our idea was to understand how to start creating those pockets of spaces that are First of all, allowing conversations, confrontations, conflicts, yes, conflicts is how communities are created. If they're not conflicts and we're trying to eliminate them, we are also eliminating the possibility of creating communities. We had even started before with a much more, um, I think, deeper concept of the understanding of how to create architectures that become platforms for anyone to create their own existence. And this was a project that we were called um, in 2015. It's called Solo Houses. And it, w it is an endeavor by a um, French uh, designer who decided to leave his profession behind and to commission architects the same way he, her wife was commissioning artists, uh, allowing them to do whatever they wanted. He often thought that architecture was so restrictive because uh, architects needed to work with, with conditions and with programs and with those things. And that time, I really thought that in order to create platforms for anybody to create their own way of living, I had to work with that anybody. I had to work with that person and not only work with that person to create the space, even become that person. I used to think I not designed for the other, I not designed with the other, I designed being the other. But obviously, that is not possible. And when I, this project came in the office, I realized how innocent I was to be thinking on that. And I, um, I, I thought of it because my first reaction was how we're gonna design a house for this project uh, when we don't have a client. I mean, that's not architecture, I thought. Uh, we really need to have someone that it, we are designing for. And then I understood that 
the truth is that it's not only that here we, don't, we didn't have someone, we never have anyone else because we are not able to become the other. We're always ourselves and we're always, even if we try very, very hard to become that other, we'll become that other with our own filters. So that means we're never anybody else or we can never be anybody else, of course. So I said, well, this is the thing. We don't need to pretend we become the other because we cannot. We don't pretend we then know everything to design what the other needs because that we have no right to do that. Let's just do architecture that can be inhabited anyway, anyhow, by that other. So what we did here, which we had all the freedom, is we created a, a specific uh, a form and we decided to hold on to our aesthetic definition because that's something we cannot escape from. Uh, any, any move we do, any physical definition we create has an aesthetical definition. So we said, let's hold into that and let's just do cubes uh, that have these beautiful shapes according to our thinking of obviously hyper subjective. Let's just spread those cubes in, in the in the landscape in order to create different possibilities of relationships, of physical relationship with those shapes and those landscapes. Let's stock them up uh, one on top of the other and let's not name them to be specific for any use at all. And then the problem started because of course we needed to submit the plans for the municipality to accept the, the project. And then is when I really understood, I realized that even drawings, how we do in architecture, are even uh, is that is this is where we even start to prescribe how anybody else should live. We needed to be very specific in which space would be the living room, which space would be the the bathroom, which space need to be the kitchen, but we didn't want to. So we challenged the way we draw. So this is one of the drawings we deliver, which it worked. The municipality accepted the house, although it's not built yet. But uh, what we did is we tried to, you cannot see it very well with the light, but um, we tried to, to do some plans that become sections, that become um, a elevation, and that are even models at the same time, because they're little uh, cut out papers that fold into each other, and that they are all of the all of the drawings, the, the one that is drawn as a plan, the one that is drawn as an elevation, the one that is drawn as a section, they're all different, so they don't correspond. So every space can be imagined to be used in different ways. Then we had to do images, and then again, no, it becomes this notion of being very prescriptive. So we were very, very direct now. We said, okay, Gonzalo, one person in the office who draw really beautiful, you decide how you will inhabit this place, and you then draw it like that. And this, we, we will say this is the house of Gonzalo. But this is not the house we're building. This is the house Gonzalo will be building. So we draw these ones in order to make it more accessible, and well, it is an experiment, but it's not yet built. In this uh, compound, which uh, the, the French designer commissioned 20 or so architects, are already two houses built, one by Petzo von Elrichhausen and one by Office from Belgium. And um, ours is waiting in the, um, in the list to be built. We don't know if this will work, but this was an attempt to start erasing uh, the imposition of um, the use of the spaces in specific ways. This, I also think, is something to think on the future, and this is I'm going to go next. In later years later, that we designed that house that is called Solo House, we were called again by, uh, in this time, it was two architects, Nerash Baita and Christoph Hesse, uh, to design a house that they uh, called 20, again, 20 or so firms uh, from different parts of the world. They gave us all um, a brief that uh, asked for a house or a design for a house for the new ways of life. And that new ways of life were described in 2017, pre-pandemic, as uh, 
a house that would allow the, the new forms of living, which was working and living in the same space. When I read the brief, for me, it was very strange because I already, since then, understood that, first of all, for me, the house is the first place of work, and it has been a place of work since ever, so it's no different. And secondly, if he was referring to productive work, that also has been done in the same a domestic environment since the start of humanity and everywhere in the world till today, except of those more urban areas where we have created this division of productive labor and domestic environment in different, in separate uh, places. So I said, well, that what they're describing is not very new. It's actually very old, ancient form of living. So why don't we think how to create, again, you know, a space for any form of life, for any way of life in the planet? So we said, OK, how do we start? How do we do design a place like that in a environment, in a single house that will be tucked in with 20 more? Um, and we said, well, let's start thinking of a space that promotes different conditions. Maybe to us, they promote something. And to someone else, they promote something different. But at least they allow us to design a space. So we described many of the things we wanted this house in our terms to be producing. We took out six of those definitions. We described them with words. Uh, those six definitions were defining each of the spaces of this house because the brief wanted six different spaces, a, a bathroom, a kitchen, two bedrooms, one living room, and one working area. And we decided, OK, we keep those six uh, areas, let's say. But they'll all would just be defining a, promoting more uh, communal spaces by opening more to the, to, to the exterior or more individual spaces by being more tucked in on how we see them, to close more spaces and putting them higher to promote more individual relationships, whatever. So we started describing those six spaces, and we created a collage for each of the spaces. Because af afterwards, we started thinking we need to translate that into uh, designing a space. This was the first problem, because obviously, for none of us who were sitting in the table designing this house, the words that we described with words me meant the same thing in images. But it was very interesting already, the process of putting together these six collages. And we put them together. And when we had them all, the six of them, we said, now what? How do we design a house with this? We put them all together, and we traced them. And this was the result. And again, we were with the problem on now what? How do we design a house with this drawing? So we started shaping the house. And we had the deadline, you know, like three days we need to deliver. So we needed to, to wrap up, finish our process, and deliver a project. We delivered this. And I must say that I was very disappointed, because when I saw this model, I thought we could have arrived to this place exactly following the brief and doing exactly the same uh, steps as we do as, since we learned them uh, from school on how to design architecture. And yeah, but I thought, well, at least the process of challenging the way we start design was something very productive. We learn a lot from the way. And that's something we will for sure follow. And that was it. And. Um, we, uh, we stopped the project, nothing happened. I thought this was even much more utopic than the other project in Spain. And all of a sudden, a year after, we got a call from, uh, from Christoph Hesse, the, the, uh, the German architect who was leading this, uh, who is leading, leading this endeavor, called us saying, ah, do you know, Tatiana, there is a couple that wants to build this house because they say it's perfect for their way of life. And I was like, oh, yeah? And what is their way of life? And how is perfect to it? And um, we ended up in a call with them, and they describe how they would use this house in a completely different way that I had imagined that I would use this house. So then I thought, well, this might be just a start on what a, a, an architecture uh, for platforms for anyone's life could start to be. And um, this, then we started uh, developing construction documents. And then we started, a, a, and we were going to start construction when a lot of things happening in the world. Um, and we, we have stopped. But as soon as things resume to normal, we're going to start building. And then 
we'll see how this house looks like. Of course, these two examples are of very, very privileged environments, and it's hard to think, then how do we take that no, in order to endeavor for really creating opportunities for the majority of the people? Well, we have trying to do that in also many different ways. The first endeavor was this, uh, a house we designed started in, well, it is not a house, it's a design strategy for a house that can be built by supposedly anyone, but it's not true, it's not completely anyone, um, in different ways. And it's a house that needs to kind of follow all the regulations of the law in Mexico because it was um, commissioned to us by, by a program that is really allowing anyone in Mexico who has zero income to uh, accede to subsidies to build these houses. So there's a lot of regulations I'm not going to explain. Um, they need to cost a maximum $8,000. They cannot be built for that money anywhere else but in Mexico. <laughs> that doesn't translate the same in euros or in, uh, in any other currency. Um, and uh, what we did is we decided to create a strategy and not a model of a house. And this strategy for us meant that this house could really allow anything no, to happen and be built in different moments. I'm not going to go into explaining what is this, why is this shaped like that, like a house, like a typical house. It's, it was a long process of learning. We did a lot of interviews to people, and I'm not going to do that. But what it, this house tried to do, really, was to understand that not everybody lives the same way exactly. First of all, in Mexico, as I said, not everybody has the kitchen tucked into their living room. Some of the people do. So this model allows that thing to happen, but also have the kitchen outside. Or also, maybe people don't need kitchen because they have communal kitchens, so the kitchen can become a grain storage or, uh, or a productive space or another room for someone that has a, a larger family. But also a house that has flexibility to grow and to be built in over time and to consolidate a space that can start with 60 square meters and that can become as big as 140 square meters in, in full and still become an own, uh, its own single structure. We built some of those houses and we demonstrated that there were many, many advantages of this process, but of course that this is still not open for every, anybody and it's still not a platform for anyone to create their own existence. So we started experimenting even more. We were called to do a house for a laboratory of housing in Mexico. And what we did is we said, okay, if um, this house can be built and use the spaces in different ways, might just be configured in different ways, and this would allow much more possibilities for community, for individuals becoming communal and collective in different ways. So we created a model of different modules. So there are four different modules that you have the instructions on how you can build those modules. And then those modules can be accommodated in different ways in order to really rely on the possibility of creating a, a, a space for your own type of social arrangement, your family, your non-family, your multi-generational family, but also that by the aggregation of those, they really create potentially different communal spaces that enable other possibilities of social relationship to do different type of work like cooking or washing or, um, or just caring for children in different ways. We have taken that even further to understand how we can do then, that was a very rural environment, not very rural, sorry, suburban environment in the outskirts of, uh, of different uh, urban areas. Um, and we are thinking then how to bring this to a very urban area, no? How to talk in, in even into an existing building um, that was um, done in the, in the colonial area, era in Mexico, and how we can really transform this possibility of a collective environment that right now is only collective to something that is much more communal. So first of all, by understanding that the, the unit can transform itself, first of all, can allow 
anything to happen. So it's not determined by, this, by its size, it's not determining where's the kitchen, where's the bathroom, if there's a kitchen, if there's a bathroom. Of course, you can put one and one, or two and two, or one and none. Uh, but also by understanding that life is a process. And as I said, you might have a, a nuclear family arrangement uh, with a husband and two kids, but that only is in your life for a certain amount of years. What happens before, what happens afterwards, you move? Well, not easy for everybody. So how can you, in the same place, expand or retract uh, within the same walls? This is a building we just um, applied for, well, actually, we applied for permits like six months ago. We were just giving the permits, and it's going to start construction very soon. This is in Mexico City. Let's see. It's, uh, it's been a very hard work to collaborate with the developers, because these developers come from an also very con conservative way of doing um, houses in Mexico, but they approach us in order to change that. And uh, we are little by little gaining spaces um, in both in the law and within the market that they, they represent to create a space like this. We are also endeavoring into another much larger project, which is a 150-unit building in Monterrey. This has started construction. It's uh, it's from now. It's in in coming out of the foundation. It's a building, a 12-story building in Average. And here they ask us for, um, for a building that could become a different uh, possibility of dwelling and ma community making. And this is what the developers that came into our office were saying. But of course, when we presented this first section, they were, uh, yeah, but not that much. But we said, no, that much. You wanted a community. What you describe is not a community. So first of all, what we did is we, we, we worked with the premise that when you make the connections much more efficient is to make the people much more productive and less less communal. Why? Because you eliminate conflict, no? By allowing that any individual to arrive to the unit in the fastest way, so the elevator, the hallway, the door. Point. Sometimes even the elevator opens to the to the unit, right? By that you eliminate the possibility of encounter with any neighbor to start with. Yes, you eliminate conflict, but again, in order to create communities, you need conflict areas. And you need to create spaces that are non-efficient for circulations, non-efficient for ventilations, that are really inefficient for all or for use let's say, to that. So we created a building that it's not related directly from the parking to the unit as every normal building, that you have to navigate in inefficient ways in order to arrive to your house. But you also have to negotiate with your neighbors in non-efficient ways on how to use different spaces. But also because of that, you have the possibility to have a community that if you cannot arrive home for something after work, they can take your kid. Uh, if you cannot cook the night before for your kids for lunch, you can have kids lunch, uh, uh, lunching anywhere else. If you need a space for holding your family for a while or uh, friends or someone that is fleeing for somewhere, you can have a place here and you can have a community that helps you. If you run out of, uh, of job and money, then you can work in this community caring for others in order to have an income for yourself. So in conclusion, we were really de the efficientizing um, the the place in order to create a thriving community. As I said, this is just going to start construction, so I don't know how it's going to happen. We've been trying to look at this instant in all the stages of uh, of collectivity. So I've been talking from the most very intimate space, but we have endeavored to much larger projects that are even trying to do communities at large. And we were invited to, to do a project in San Francisco where the basis is to understand how to produce um, a space 
that becomes the element that gives value to the very detrimented community that is around. This is challenging the norms of uh, private property, and this is trying to challenge them, challenge them in San Francisco, which is one of the most expensive cities in the world, um, where real estate is just goes crazy. So here in the site, there was a power plant which was very polluting and really detrimenting uh, the whole community. So obviously, who lived around the poorest people in San Francisco? When these poor people won a lawsuit to close down the power plant, um, then the, the site became really subject to gentrification in, in a second. Because just by eliminating the polluting industry, not doing anything else in the site, you would attract every, anybody to invest in this place because obviously it's very central in San Francisco and it's in one of the most expensive cities. So we were called to say, okay, how can you do a project that doesn't gentrify the population and really allows everybody to live in? And I said, well, I have some news. Um, it's already gentrifying because by just removing the industry, polluting industry, you are just welcoming the investors here to find another place in San Francisco to live. So we started working with lawyers to understand how to unlock the possibilities of um, value creating, not only by what does in the space physically, so not by our job only, but by how this can give economical value to the society. This was a job of the lawyers and not ours, but our project was based exactly on that, on understanding how we could create a community that is really holding to the past and is understanding its, its past, industrial past, to create a kind of a neighborhood that holds all the community together. And we also created a lot of design tools like this wheel. I'm not going to uh, explain how it did. We created even our own um, kind of chart that would qualify our, that will uh, test our own work. Um, but the most important thing, I think, that when, when we were working on this project, we were really working together with the community and with the lawmakers in order to potentialize what architecture can possibilitate, but if nothing else happens, then this project really could become very harmful for the society, for the community that lives now there and that won the lawsuit, because it obviously is going to expel them. Because if we do a beautiful neighborhood here, only that, uh, that has a lot of community spaces and an open free areas and markets and workshops and you whatever, the rest of the community is going to be uh, expelled in no time because the property is going to become much more valuable. The project had a very important first, uh, this was the power plant that was there, and when it was turned down and the site was remediated, the only thing that was left was a, a very big um, substation, electrical substation. So in order for the community to think what was hap going to happen in all these site, the first task for us was to remove that substation and to relocate it to this plot nearby. What we did is we said, okay, we're gonna do the, f the, the, um, the representation of this infrastructure that is very important because, going to, because at the end it's giving light to the whole neighborhood. We're gonna do a building that protects that infrastructure but that becomes the representation of it but it's also the first project in this place. So it's not only that, it's the first one that opens the space that used to be private and only for the industry, for the community. This substation is gonna start construction really soon. The, the bidding has been done, uh, the permits have been been approved. It's been a little delayed because of prices that are raising up so much. Uh, but as soon as that, that is done, then we're able to continue with what happens in their neighborhood next. We, and this is almost the last project I'm talking, sorry, it's been taking very long. Um, then the next scale of projects is thinking, okay, what happens, um, as I was saying, in the future? So not only thinking on a specific use, no, for a determining a specific uh, use at the moment, it's also thinking on the future. If we're gonna spend all this carbon to build these buildings, let them, let them or let those buildings last for thousands of years. 
This is not the, th the, the way we are thinking of building right now. Every material in the construction realm um, that I have found has a guarantee of 10 or 20 years. And I'm like, uh, windows, 20 years only? And we have to throw them away? This building should last a 1,000 years. But I don't think we're designing this way. I think that if we see of the skylines of today, many of the buildings that we see are not going to disappear in a 1,000 years. And it's a big problem, because never in humanity we have expelled so much um, a carbon fossil, we have um, wasted so much carbon fossils uh, to build anything, and we are wasting it because very few of the things are going to last. And one of the reasons why they don't last is not only the materials that they are built with, but it's also the fact uh, that they're very determined for a very specific use, so it's very hard to reuse them again. I mean, this was a former monastery, and now it's a, it's a museum. Who knows what? What's happening in a thousand years. This building had a very interesting program because they asked us to do a building that had a hundred thousand square meters. It's huge. Half of it is parking. But the idea is that the parking is only transitional. The transitional moment uh, that this building is built for doesn't mean that this building it will only be transitional. Uh, the idea of the university was to remove, before we did the building, all these uh, areas, open areas, were parking lots. And the first idea was to remove the, park, the parking from the campus. And the second idea, which they've been working for 10 years now with the municipality, is to remove cars all and all from their campus. But this cannot be done yet because people cannot arrive to this university in, trans in public transport, not yet. It's in Monterrey, it's in a very industrial city, a very, um, Amer a, a, let's say, US uh, city built like because it's dependable 100% on the car. So we build the building thinking that right now it's going to be used by cars, but hopefully by very soon, it's going to not be used by cars anymore, and it's going to be used by people. So the first thing we said, OK, normally, if you start design, if you need to do a building that half of it is parking, because even so, to, to do an apartment building that most of it is for people, you start designing it from the structure of the car. We said, now this building needs to be designed for the people and needs to hold cars in the beginning. So we say, OK, let's rationalize a structure, but a structure that is able to be related to the human scale. So how we do that, we divided it, we transgressed it, we opened it to the landscape, we put it in and out. And this is how we start scaling that structure to create spaces that allow many possibilities, not only the parking, but also the humans that inhabit it, but more and more the humans that will inhabit it. And then um, how to think uh, of these buildings as also the possibility of the extensions of the relationships of ourselves with the ecosystem that we are part of. We often see architecture not only as something that is for the now, that it will serve for the people right now in the way of the living that we suppose it's forever, but it is truly not, and in an impositive way, but also is limiting our possibility not only to relate to others, but to relate to our own ecosystem by creating limits. I think architecture should mediate our life. Uh, with the environment in order and with others in order for it to become a healthy relationship. We now exist in a place where we think it's us and nature. It's not us and nature, or us, we can dominate nature, or we can detriment nature, or we can change nature. We are nature. We are part of this ecosystem um, that is almost expelling us because we are alienating ourselves from that ecosystem more and more. And architecture is a culprit of that. In the stance of yes, of comfort, of health, of security, call it whatever, but more and more is alienating us from our, the nature that surrounds us. We have been working for 17 years in a botanical garden that our whole idea is to understand how to really allow you to live and in, 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 in work and learn in this place, which has an, also a very extreme weather, uh, 
50, sometimes of the year 50 degrees centigrade, but normally 30, very, very, very hot. And how can you really always be reminded, first of all, that you are nature, and second of all, that you are here in the botanical garden in the center, yes, in the very center of a city called Culiacán, but in a botanical garden. So we created uh, this architecture as this mediator of the, of, the, of the possibilities of humans in this place, but not as a limitator. What does it mean that we have created, for example, these compounds of buildings that are related but not completely linked together? So in this case, these two buildings you see, one is an auditorium, the other one is a room for workshops, and there's a third building here that it's a service area. So if you're in the auditorium of the workshop, except if you're children, because obviously we understand the emergencies of children, you need to go out to go to the bathroom. If it's raining, yes, you need to get wet to go to the bathroom. There, if there's a bird singing, you hear the bird and then you go to the bathroom. But the idea is that you always remind that you are in a botanical garden. You're not in a shopping center, you're not in an airport, you're not in the middle of the city, you're not in your house. You're in a botanical garden. Yes, you are going to get wet. But yes, you are also going to be amazed by the fact that you are always reminded that we are part of that and that nature is us and that we are nature. Because we did this, well, we not, didn't did this project, we're still doing, we're still adding little pieces by pieces in this botanical garden, which is an amazing opportunity for us, which I'm not gonna describe why, because that's another whole lecture. Um, we were called to do uh, another intervention in the same state, the state of Sinaloa, um, of a central park. This central park in this city had been called Central Park since ever, but it has never been a park, uh, because it contains a natural regulating lagoon. And the city had grown and grown and grown forever, in and out. Um, it's a city in the Pacific Ocean of Mexico. It's called Mazatlán. It used to be one of the most important touristic spaces. The places it, become, it became then a, 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 a um, a more service a city, and the city, as I said, grew and, and grew everywhere, but except here in this central area, because it had this natural regulating lagoon. What it means that it's a lagoon that fluctuates in level depending the season of the year. So people were not able to use it. So we were appointed to think how could we consolidate this as a park? And we thought this was a very interesting opportunity to think of a space that would allow these people to understand that relationship with nature. Because Mazatlan has, again, also a temperature that doesn't fluctuate much year round. So it's like 35 degrees year round, is near the beach in the Pacific Ocean. Yes, it's very beautiful. But that doesn't allow you to understand the cycles of life. Where here you are exposed all the year long, no? It's uh, it's winter or it's uh, uh, spring or it's fall or it's summer or it's summer or it's fall, and then again and again, and you understand much more and you're exposed to these circles more and more. Although architecture is preventing you more and more to do that, so, but in any case, naturally speaking, you are exposed to this fact. But in Mazatlan, nobody does that, so nobody thinks there are seasons, but they are, of course. So this and this. Lagoon is exactly the example that there are seasons. No, the lagoon goes in and out year round. So what we decided to do is to enhance that possibility and create three types of spaces that are very well resumed exactly in this point in the in the park, where they, there are areas that are always flooded. Areas that are sometimes flooded and sometimes dry, like this plaza, and areas that are all the time dry. And uh, they have different uses according to different times of the year. So possibilitating the idea of you relating to that natural cycle and using the spaces in a different way, which I see, which as I say, here is naturally given, but not here in, in Mazatlan. We knew that when we designed this park, there were two very big, big pieces of infrastructure coming, a very big museum that had no collection but already had a project, and a very big aquarium because there, there is an aquarium in that place in this area southeast of the park uh, as 
for, for years and years. So they had already, before we started designing this park, they had already commissioned an architectural office from the United States to design an aquarium. So we arrived when the museum and the aquarium were designed. When we were consolidating already the lagoon and uh, cleaning it, the first step was to clean because it was uh, all the, the hotels around and all the houses around would just uh, put their sewage there. So we started recon doing the whole infrastructure for the city, cleaning the lagoon, consolidating the, the, the path around. We were asked uh, if we would like uh, to do the aquarium, redesign the aquarium. They already had the design because they thought that that aquarium didn't look like an aquarium. And for me, it was very difficult to think that I was going to do that aquarium uh, because I always was against that project. First of all, because the project had penguins uh, in, on, on the bottom of a uh, um, glass dome in Mazatlan at 50 degrees. Yes, I don't know how they were going to plan to control that temperature. But um, second of all, because I always have thought of aquariums as being that um, program that is very well described by this mural by Diego Rivera called Man Controller of the Universe. Um, as I said, we think, and men think, and yes, normally men, 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 <laughs> genderized men, think that uh, we can control nature and we can decide the curse of nature and we can control everything. And we are, we thought, we think of ourselves Man Controller of the Universe. And the aquarium is just kind of, for me, the program that really uh, represents that by uh, bringing to our world that world where we cannot go in the majority of us we cannot leave this world so I told the the people uh, that I was against this project and I was against first of all because of that and second of all because they have the uh, they have the the site uh, just in the doorstep of the one of the most important natural aquariums in the whole world, which is the Sea of Cortez. Mazatlan, and sorry I don't have a map, is in the, if you know the geography of Mexico, it has a peninsula, which is called the Baja Peninsula. The sea between the Baja Peninsula and the country is the Sea of Cortez. And Mazatlan is just on the side of the country, um, in the doorstep of that vast sea that is really an example of uh, the, the, the vast ecosystem of the sea in the world. So I told them all my preoccupations and they said, Tatiana, this is why we're looking for you because we really think exactly the same. So I said, well, first of all, we need to understand how to create an institution that really uh, allow us to understand that we are part of this ecosystem. Not that we brought this one to make our fantasies rea reality and we're not gonna put penguins here. So how can we do it? We need the experts who allow us to do it. So we uh, were able to reach to the people of the Aquarium of Vancouver who are called OceanWise and they are one of the most important world organizations protecting the seas and creating this uh, kind of educational um, in re research and um, kind of cultural compound that al has allowed uh, the program to protect the seas in many ways and many species around the world. So we, we put them in as the first uh, kind of foremost thinkers of the project. And then we started with them thinking, okay, then what is this building uh, that is really allowing us to create this relationship with this world that we don't know in truth. So we thought that it was much better to find uh, paths in a building that was built in the year two, 2020 that was flooded in the year 2100 and that in the year 2200 the water receded and then we were able to discover that nature really took over and we arrived in the year 2300 to open channels and create stairs, first of all, to bring you to the top of the building to see how nature had taken over this building on top, and then tuck you in in the center to bring you inside this building and to discover how nature really had taken over in full 
of this building and had really um, allowed us to see no, how and what is this world that we often cannot see, and by ourselves only opening paths for that. This building is right now being built and is waiting for that nature to take over because it's 2020, 2022, and hopefully that nature comes in and invades this building very soon, so we very soon are able to discover it. And with this, I finish. Thank you very much. I don't know if there are time for questions. I know it yes. was very long, very sorry. <laughs> yes, first of all, we wanted to thank you very much for this eye-opening uh, lecture. It was um, definitely very, uh, it showed us the different way that we are used to live to our comfort and privilege, also the different perception, not from anthropocentric point of view. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I hope you have energy for questions. Yes, of course, <laughs> I do. Więc drodzy Państwo, czy są jakieś e, osoby chętne, żeby zadać pytanie w języku angielskim czy polskim? To niezależne. Jeśli tak, to proszę o podniesienie dłoni i Dominika podejdzie z mikrofonem. Uh, hello, Tatiana. Thank you for your lecture. It was a privilege to hear you again. I was on your lecture in 2008 in Dublin, and I remember your house that you designed uh, with the round um, swimming pool. And now you change uh, the idea how we can think about the house. So my question is, what, uh, what do you think, uh, what is the biggest challenge for architects? now in the climate change and economy uh, how economy change uh, those days uh, for me from your lecture is kind of uh, architecture could be kind of organism which change and develop and um, grow like like a plant almost and kind of you created for me kind of um, alphabet uh, that uh, is international and you can exchange uh, depends of the climate and uh, where do you design the space but uh, the most important now is how we can what is the challenge for us how we can convince clients and of course if we have uh, big clients who develop big uh, areas uh, for living for people and uh, how big uh, how we should be, uh, uh, how we can change uh, their minds, that they will understand what is important now, yeah. So first of all, I think you got it very <coughs> rightly, because I think one of the biggest challenges of architecture is to understand really deeply, truly, in, inside its bones, inside its bricks, uh, that architecture is a very static thing, while life is a process. And that architecture, very static thing, needs to hold that process of life. So how can we really create something that possibilitates that process is one of the biggest challenges I, th I think architecture has, but that we really have not dared to address it in full, in full conscious, not all of us at least. And uh, so, yes, I think that that is one very big responsibility because as long as we understand that, we will also become much more uh, conscious on the moves we do. And therefore, obviously, that just creates a positive response in terms of the environment because it is, you know, kind of saving those resources, allowing a building to become a platform for a life process that doesn't need to transform, destroy, rebuild again, build more, no, or, uh, or create more problems as it is now. If, if you remember the first part of the lecture, I was trying to say how the architecture that we're doing today responds to the society of production. Very clearly, I was just putting the example of the Mayan Peninsula, where by, you know, 
modernizing the way they live or systematizing the way they live, we are creating more necessities for them in, instead of less. So if they need to transform their house to the house we think is ideal, they need air conditioning. That damages the, the environment in many ways, as we know, I ne don't need to describe it. So that's very direct that I'm saying. But this is the whole environment, exactly the same. If we are creating societies that need to produce in order to exist, we are going to destroy the planet no matter how, because to produce, we need to exploit, and we need to exploit both the planet and the people. And these are limited resources that are ending, that are finishing. But nevertheless, the society is still relying on that. So it's like the cat biting its tail. So I do think that architecture in the broader sense needs to understand that life is a process, and that life is what needs to hold. No, not production, not productive, is life. So if we are able to sustain life with these buildings and the people don't need to produce to, be sus to sustain and can produce but not need to, then we are going to transform society and we're going to be able to save the resources that we are finishing now. And I think that um, the, towards the, the, the second, well, I don't know if it was second question or comment, you know, you know on how to convince the people, I am not trying to convince anyone. I'm just very committed to what I believe is right. And if I encounter someone that really doesn't un understand or doesn't share my beliefs, I will not work with them. If we all commit ourselves to do that, which is difficult because I understand I come from a very privileged position um, and not everybody can do it, but if we do, we can contribute, and we should do it in our own terms, no? I always put in this question the example of the plastic bag. We, I have a plastic bottle here, so to start, I am part of the problem, no? So we all think, ah, what is going to do one? Is one I have, I'm thirsty, no? Well, if we all think like that, we consume millions and billions of tons of plastic and we're not gonna change. We need to understand that whatever we do is this, what, as small as thing as we do, if we all think like that, we will be able to change it. But if we think, well, whatever I do is not important, it's not going to impact, the problem is too big, nothing is going to change. So that would say, hold to your thoughts and don't work for, you will find, I promise you, I promise if you stick to it, you will find places to work and be able to survive. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have another question. Uh, ja chciałam tylko jeszcze poinformować osoby, które są z nami online, że również przez YouTube'a można zadawać pytania w komentarzach. My zerkamy i czekamy. Dziękuję bardzo. Nazywam się Hanna Szuty. Ja się zajmuję ochroną środowiska. Nie jestem architektką. Um, tutaj powiedzieliśmy, pani już w, tym ostatnim, w tej ostatniej odpowiedzi poruszyła temat adaptacji do zmiany klimatu. Chciałabym, żebyśmy się przenieśli na chwileczkę do naszej szerokości geograficznej, jeżeli chodzi o to, jak nasze budynki tutaj się będą adaptować. Jeżeli chodzi o produkcję energii, no to mamy już na całym świecie, również tutaj w Polsce, nowe technologie, ale chciałam się dowiedzieć, czy jeżeli chodzi o materiały budowlane, Mamy również coś, co można by powiedzieć, że jest dzisiaj rewolucyjne albo że jesteśmy chwilę przed jakimś takim przełomem, co na przykład nam dały panele fotowoltaiczne, turbiny wiatrowe albo pompy ciepła. Więc jestem bardzo zainteresowana, jak Pani w swojej pracy też śledząc pewne trendy widzi pewne przemiany, które nastąpią w użyciu coraz tańszych materiałów budowlanych, które nie będą emitowały tak dużej ilości gazów cieplarnianych, jak na przykład przy, przy produkcji betonu, cementu. Dziękuję bardzo. Yes, thank you. I think this is a very relevant question because I think that uh, that is one of the most uh, pressing issues, no, uh, right now. So first of all, I think that the first problem is that there is no single solution for the whole world and we need to really become local right now to understand that that is the only solution that could really serve for everybody. Because, for example, no, in, uh, here you, are, you have a lot of um, 
wood available, no? And now that it has becoming a trend, it's starting to become a problem because obviously if you substitute the way you built with wood, then you're gonna finish <laughs> the, the, the wood in the world. But not only that, I mean, here you have wood and you can do that. In Mexico, we don't have wood. We don't have wood. There's the soil is not good to grow trees that are strong enough to become uh, building, construct, building construction material. So again, there's no possibility of you know uh, standardizing the solution. We need to think what works here and what works there. But for me, what really works is to use those materials much more efficiently. So again, it's not only about changing the way we fuel the things we do. So it's not only about eliminating carbon fossils. I always remember in this case, the, the, uh, I read a, a guy saying, which I don't remember his name and it's very bad because I should cite him, but I don't remember him. But he said, let's never forget that Tesla didn't come to save the planet, it came to save the car industry. So let's think, no? I mean, if we all change to electric cars, we're gonna have the same exact problem in which we are now. Because everybody says, no, but if we source that with solar energy, no, 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 but the lithium, the batteries that are done, the roads that the cars need to exist, the form of the city with each, which is based on, uh, on this possibility of energetic abundance, uh, it's needing you to drive a car, so then this is never going to end, you know? So we need to change the way we relate to each other. That's, for, for me, the profound change, much more than the type of materials, yes, that needs to change as well. The type of, or how we use those materials, yes, that needs to change as well. But we need to change the way we exist in this planet, because as I said, if we still rely on the notion of production, any, any production of any type, solar, wind, um, it involves material extraction, material consumption, material that at the end of the line is not renewable. For, because for tr using solar, solar panels, use lithium, the lithium also is a limited resource. So if we transform the energy that we use in the whole world, the same amount with solar, we have the same problem. <laughs> Nothing is changing. So we need to change how we relate to each other, how we consume, how we produce, and then we're gonna be thinking of changing. So my, my state is we need to, yes, use better things, but differently. Using it the same way, we're not going to arrive anywhere. Ja już widziałam kolejne pytanie, więc może przekażę mikrofon. First of all, I would like to thank you very much and on behalf of organizer of the festival, I would like to hand to you a catalog of the oh. festival and Thanks. few books, very small one but uh, showing what we as a local branch of uh, association of Polish architects do. And I have a very short question. What's the difference between being an advisor to municipality and a designer for a municipality? That's a great question. Thank you for asking me that. Uh, you probably you know much. I am. I was an advisor at the... Um, um, uh, urban planning and uh, social housing ministry of the city of Mexico. And when I was there, I decided that I could become much more critical to create profound changes from the private realm rather than from the public. And why I thought that, because by being an engaged citizen and by being a professional that doesn't belong to to any type of political association or that doesn't have to respond to any political association because every minister in the world, regardless of how um, impartial they are, at the end they end up you know, becoming partially responding to their own interests. I needed to become much more um, an advocate from the outside 
to create change. So what I think profoundly is that uh, architecture needs to be understood in many ways. So as I was saying in the beginning, um, one of the things that architecture has created no, is this perpetuation of the fact that we need to live in this type of dwelling that is really changing the, the way of everybody's uh, life, but also creating the necessities of this production to exploit the planet in many ways, as I explained with the Mayan house. So if we architect things, we only need to reproduce that, and that's our task. Again, nothing is going to change. I think if we architects understand that this creates a, a really big impact in the way p societies are formed, we need to be impacting also policies. So architecture is not only designing beautiful objects. Architecture is also doing policies and doing thinking. Um, and by advocating those things, or either through the object you build or really by demonstrating those through there uh, and changing is the bigger the impact. So I would argue that there is a huge necessity to open uh, the, the definition of architecture and what architects should be doing and really uh, understanding that you do even more if you are uh, going into with your design to policy uh, than anything else. Do we have, czy mamy other questions, inne pytania? I'm not an architect, too. civil engineer. Uh, but uh, about materials, we are talking about developing of materials. Uh, you have told a lot uh, about uh, local solution. Uh, are you looking for a very old solution? For example, uh, making bricks only of clay reinforced with straw. We need not many energy, we make only a form. I have heard once about a special solution in Tropicari with uh, a wall with a special ventilation that, that was uh, that needs uh, no special energy, but it was efficient. It was developed many, many years before. Uh, of course, that was only small information. Maybe you have uh, more experience with uh, such uh, solutions. Yes, um, actually, in my country, there are several materials that have been used millenary t in millenary times that are really sourced from very local, um, very local materials, and I think those are the best. The problem is, and the very big problem, and which I realized in, uh, when I was trying to help the reconstruction of the houses um, in the earthquake in 2017, that we have created a society that uh, two days ago I was with Alejandro Aravena and he was saying the Kardashian society, meaning these um, social influencers that are spreading a type of living that now is desirable for every person in the planet. So when we arrived to these little towns, we obviously immediately knew that we were, if we were able to rescue those ancient forms of building the houses, not they would only be much better responsive to the environment, they would not fall down because they knew how to build them, and they would be able to build much more space because they would be much cheaper. So we were trying to rebuild those ancient techniques when we realized it was not possible because we have been telling to these people everywhere in the world that the progress and the modern way of living is to having a house done with concrete and with steel and with bricks, and this is progress. And they need a house that looks like a house and that really has a living room and a garden. And they need that and they want that. And now you come back and you say, no, you know what? That actually is not the correct way of living. We should go back to whatever you have been building that we call poor, precarious, uh, not usable. You need to rebuild other things again. Well, on the other hand, I don't think it's fair. So we need to start, you know, working in social media, in media, to demonstrate that uh, building with mud, building with straw, building with sticks 
is cool and it's the Kardashian way of living. Let's try, let's find uh, an influencer that says that in order to change the course of this planet. <laughs> okay, are there any other questions? Czy mamy jakieś jeszcze pytania? Powoli uh, zbliżamy się do końca, więc... Dobrze. Thank you, Marysia. Thank you very much once again for your lecture and your presence here. Thank you. Dziękuję również Państwu za takie pytania, bardzo aktywne. Teraz, zanim przejdziemy, może podziękujemy brawami. Thank you very much. Zanim przejdziemy jeszcze, już ominął nas punkt kulminacyjny, więc chyba wszyscy wiemy, że zbliżamy się do końcowych momentów naszego otwarcia festiwalu, więc teraz chcielibyśmy zaprezentować i zaprosić wkrótce autorów kuratorskiej, programowej pierwszy raz wystawy Dolnośląskiego Festiwalu Architektury. So now uh, we will switch also to both Polish and English, and uh, we would like to ask uh, Barbara Nawrocka and Dominika Wilczyńska, who are the curators not only of the festival, but also uh, of the exhibition Ambulatorium, uh, to give us a few words about the idea. Thank you. Tytuł Ambulatorium jest zaczerpnięty, jak zdajecie sobie Państwo sprawę, z, z ze słownika medycznego i oznacza miejsce doraźnej pomocy. My chcemy powiedzieć, że te terminy, które też się wiążą z pomocą, z troską, z empatią, są blisko związane z architekturą i tym samym przenosimy te terminy na podwórko architektoniczne. Używamy ich w naszej wystawie. Do współpracy przy tej wystawie zaprosiłyśmy siedem osób, które podzieliłyśmy w trzy grupy, tak aby powstały trzy instalacje. O tych instalacjach nie będziemy opowiadać, autorzy są z nami i z pewnością zrobią to sami najlepiej. Natomiast to, co jest dla nas też ważne, to sam projekt architektury wystawy ponieważ on w jakiś sposób transponuje idee, które są zawarte też w, w naszych głównych myślach, a mianowicie reuse, który łączy się z troską paradoksalnie bardzo mocno, jeżeli chodzi o współczesną architekturę. Ten reuse towarzyszył nam w tworzeniu wystawy, ponieważ zanim zaczęłyśmy pracować nad przestrzenią, wybrałyśmy się wraz z ekipą tutejszego muzeum do magazynów, żeby zinwentaryzować artefakty pozostałe po poprzednich wystawach. Ta inwentaryzacja jest dostępna w tym momencie poprzez kod QR, który jest na tablicy, na wystawie. Można sobie to pobrać i mamy nadzieję, że kiedyś w przyszłości ktoś będzie, znaczy mam nadzieję, że już teraz tylko będzie w taki sposób budować się tutaj wystawy. Kod jest do pobrania, a inwentaryzacje poszczególnych elementów są dostępne dla wszystkich, także bardzo prosimy przejmować. No i myślę, że będziemy powoli oddawać głos autorom uh, installacy. Uh, so I'll repeat it in English now. Uh, our uh, um, exhibition title, Ambulatorium, is a magical term uh, and it means a place of emergency care and what we wanted to talk about is also emergency and care but in a more architectural context. Uh, we invited seven people uh, and uh, um, I mean, to, to work in three groups and to make three different projects concerning um, 
um, nowadays crises. Uh, the installations are all about care and reuse, but we're gonna uh, let uh, the authors talk by themselves. We're not only curators of the exhibition, but also the designers of the ex exhibition, as uh, uh, the director of the museum already said. And this all elements uh, that we use to build the exhibition uh, are the elements that uh, where, I mean, they were created like the previous exhibitions of the museum, so they are all uh, recycled elements. And uh, mm, each of these red painted element has its own story. If you want to hear it, the director of the museum, probably you should ask him, he knows it all. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Emma.